thank you for joining me. I appreciate you. I wanted to start off because, you know, we're doing this salute to Southern Soul. Right. And uh, there nowadays we have names and labels for everything. It used to just be R&B, used to just be soul music. How would you define or describe what Southern Soul is? Um, if if I had to describe Southern Soul, Southern Soul to me is nothing more than a new twist for the younger people to relate to it better from the blues. And as you know, it's all just new rebirthing of the blues. Either way, you know, I don't know why they want to, like you said, they want to label it. Just call it what it is. It's soul blues music. I love it. I love it. What do you think, especially because of the long history of this music? You know, it's the roots of R&B. Uh, it's the roots of hip hop. Um, it's the roots of all, a lot, all of our black music that, that we listen to that's popular now. Yeah. What do you think is its biggest influence on the music of today? And does it get the credit it deserves in how it has influenced the culture? I'm going to answer that latter part first. It definitely, it definitely does not get the credit that it deserves. Strong foundation that this blues have. And I'm going to give you a quick run of what the blues did and what it's still doing today. It's like, we run away from the, the name blues, but the young white generation, they embrace it. Why is that? So if you ask the average young person, what are your musical heritage? They couldn't answer it. First thing they're gonna tell you, they'll probably say, Kanye West, Jay-Z, something like that. Then if they do, watch this. Kanye West got his break, his big break, not from just being a producer, but from the blues. Give you a quick, give you, give you a quick example. The Ray Charles. I got a woman way across town that's good to me. Oh, yeah, I got a woman way across town. So back then it had a swing with, with the blues drive and a touch of gospel because the blues and the gospel, they're brothers and sisters. Country music is just a child of the blues and the gospel. But then when Kanye West took Jamie Foxx and put him on the record. She give me money when I'm in need. That's Ray Charles still. But the young folk are gonna say, oh no, that's Kanye West. No, it's not. That's Ray Charles. So hopefully I gave you a good answer to that. You did, you did, because I think a lot of times we forget about uh, the ancestry, the genealogy, the the roots of where we come from. And if we don't know or remember where we've been, we can't know where we're going next and and, and do that in a way that that is um, uh, productive for everybody. You're 100 percent correct. I was just telling a young man and that young man is right there in Chicago. Some call him Jay Adam. Some call him Slick. Yeah, he, I've known this young man for a while. You don't get that type of soul unless somewhere down in your DNA from your forefathers, it came out of you. Good example. No matter how much October London want to run from what he really is, he still has to be related to down in him because when you listen to his other songs they are good but they're not as good as the stuff of him doing Marvin even though his, his song is original but when you finish if you dress it up clean it up it's still Marvin 
preach because I said the same thing when I heard that song. When I heard that, that ain't song, nothing but distant lover. Yep. Lover, lover. But why, like you said in the in the first question, why do we have to have labels? Why can't we just as black people be that guy that can sing? Why do I have to be just a blues singer? God didn't gift me and give me a label. Willa Clayton, you're just going to be a blues singer. Okay, then. How come Willa Clayton have had gospel inspiration in music to where it was nominated for Stellas? Why does Willa Clayton have five top 10 R&B records? Now, watch this. Before the R was put before the B, it wasn't nothing but the beat. And, and the reason of the R is because the rhythm. What gave us the rhythm? From our ancestors from Africa, which was the beat. Because if if all you got is just a guitar and a piano, you have what? No rhythm. So the blues is the root. Take a tree. A tree cannot last. A tree will not grow without the root. Preach. You know, when it's all said and done, I love all genres of music. I'm not going to let no one pigeonhole me in one place. It just so happened a lot of the soulful stuff comes from where? The blues. And there you have it. I love it. I love it. Because the thing is, is that I wonder how many of us focus on, we, we're we given the labels, so we adhere to the labels and we forget about what we're hearing and doing unless until you get to a certain age and you've heard enough things and you remember enough things. Because like I remember growing up, um, and my daddy and my mom are listening to Tyrone Davis and, you know, Millie Jackson and, uh, you know, the state mm -hmm. singers and Johnny Taylor. Exactly. Child, listen, you couldn't tell my auntie nothing about Johnny Taylor. OK, Martin <laughs> Cease, like, you know what I'm saying? People who, right. you know, what they Bobby, the Womax, you know, what they call tavern music in Chicago sometimes. Right. Right. Um, but. It, it the thing that I find interesting about it though, growing up listening to that, it it helps me to hear things now, and I'm grateful for it because when I was young, I don't know if I appreciated it the way that I appreciate it now, and yes. I hear it in in different music and how I hear the influences. One of the things that I find really interesting is how so many artists that are part of this this deep soul music that are from Chicago or have chosen to make Chicago home and you at one point were based here, we still claim you. Um, what is it about this city that supports th that sort of roots black music and always has? And, and it's been an exchange where a lot of artists have come from Chicago and gone down to Memphis to record like you did and things like what what is it about chicago that that connects to that musical heritage so strongly let me tell you that is a great question and i'm gonna do my best to give you a superb answer look at it like this and it's a fact the reason that chicago is so in tune and love the southern music sound so much here's why get ready gene because i'm about to hit you i know what you're jerry about to butler. say because everybody don't jerry want to hear butler. It. jerry butler came from sunflower mississippi jimmy reed came from sunflower mississippi ruby andrews came from sunflower mississippi bb king came from in Denola, Mississippi, originally from Itabina, but they say he was from in Denola because his parents moved there. Little Milton from Inverness, Mississippi. That's the Delta. John Lee Hooker is out of Clarksdale. That's the Delta. 
Howlin' Wolf is out of the Delta from over there around Rolling Fault. Muddy Waters, they're all from the Delta. And guess where they ended up? They came to Chicago because that was the only means and the only way for the black man to be able to provide for his family, whether he was an entertainer or whether he just was a working man, because in the South, he had no opportunity. And all of the, the black artists, whether you was a female or male, Denise LaSalle from Belzoni, Mississippi, they all ended up in Chicago. Seal Johnson, Chicago, from Mississippi, from Mississippi to Chicago. You go down the list. The soul come from the South. Aretha Franklin from Memphis, not Detroit. It's the soul. It's because you can sing with so much soul because it's in your root. Your mama, your daddy, your granddaddy, your grandmama, they was out there in the cotton fields working. All they had was a biscuit in their mouth and they had what? The blues. So the blues is nothing bad. The blues is the only thing, the only thing that as a black race that we own. That's all we have. Stop running from it and embrace it. Amen. So that's why, and let me tell you, Chicago, it ain't nothing but a big old Mississippi. And a big old dog on Arkansas, and a big old. Hey, listen, somebody had to say it, so I'm saying it. I guess that's why y'all picked me, and I'm and I'm grateful that y'all did because, like I said, some people don't want to hear the truth. Some people can't handle the truth. Listen, but I'm gonna give it straight. Amen. Because you know, when I first moved up here, I made a comment about people being country because that's where the people were from. Because I'm from Louisiana. I'm country. I said, calling me country is not a bad thing to me. And no. child, when I said it, I, I damn near got cursed out because I was like, oh, I forgot y'all were city folks. But I know where your grandmama and them from and I know where you, you spend your summers. But that's right. And guess what? And guess what? If your grandmama or your great-grandmama is from Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, Tennessee. Guess what? I don't care how you dress it up, fix it up. You still from the country too. You take that bloodline. And guess what? I wish we had more grandmamas and granddaddies and great granddaddies in the way that Miss Pearl and them next, next door were just maybe it would cut out some of this black on black crime. Because if you listen to the blues, you listen to the story, it is keeping our race together, not separating, not fighting, not hurting one another. It was all love. If I got in trouble, the lady down the street, Pop my butt, and when I got home, my mama didn't play. And that's just the way it is. But, but, and if you want to really get that real soul thing, you're gonna have to come to the south to get it, whether you like it or not. Look at Al Green. I don't care where he go, what he do, he still got that soul. That's that Arkansas. That's that. That's that. That's that country in you, but it don't make a difference because that is who we are. Stop running from it. Embrace it. And I'm going to tell you one last thing, Gene. What's that? Michael Jackson, this is only my opinion to this day, is still the best and the greatest that have did it. But guess what? His One of his biggest records, and the record that we all realize that, oh my God, this dude is a superstar. He's a megastar. Then he became so big in the pop world from that song called Billy G, it's not my lover. It's just a girl 
But guess where the record come from? It came from Jimmy Reed. The bass line to Billie Jean. Yeah. I figure you, I figure you, I figure you rock back on that. Billie Jean bass line in the drums caught everybody. Slow it down. Slow it down now. Slow the song down. You got Jimmy Reed. Oh, baby. You don't have to go. They got the same changes. Jimmy Reed go to, I'll, I'll pack my bags. Down that road, I'll go. Billy Jean. Then he go to the change. Stafford People all told me, be careful what you do. Don't go around breaking young girls' huh? They're the same change. The same change. Just I up. promise you, there are so many people don't even know that. But I do. And I consider myself to be a student of music. And that's what you got me stumped on that one. I'm telling you, don't believe me. Go get the Jimmy Reed record. Play the Michael Jackson record. There are identical the same that's i'm you know i'm going to do it right after we get off this call so look what do you think <laughs> is the reason or how it worked out that so many chicago artists ended up recording in memphis like when you when you talk about stacks when you talk about high records muscle shoals a lot of the artists that were here were artists on those labels, people like the Staple Singers, the Emotions, you know, uh, people who were going to all these different places to record. Even folks from, from Detroit were going down to Muscle Shoals to do that. Why do you think that was? The Southern musicians had that ingredient that would make a hit record. Even Motown which was based out of Detroit, the musician, what they call them, the brothers. Anyway, all the musicians that was that was playing at Motown come from Mississippi and some parts of the South. When Al Green hit, everyone felt like, okay, Willie Mitchell and High Records, they have this secret ingredient. If we go there and record, we're going to get a hit record. Not so. But they had the musicians. And if you were looking for that certain sound, and when you talk about muscle shows, they really had that ingredient. That's where all those big hits for Wilson Pickett, Aretha Franklin, and a matter of fact, even people like Elton John them came from way overseas to come to muscle shows. You know, because they was looking for that ingredient and it was only coming out of the South. Or some Southern musician go to the North. Now let's talk about the how the session bands affected that because you recorded at High Records, so you work with High Rhythm. Um, yes. Booker T and the MGs and the Barquets over at Stax. Of course, Muscle Shoals, as you just mentioned, um, what was the power of those house bands and what did they mean to not only the label sound and for the artist sounds and for the hits they were trying to create, but for the genre as a whole? Because these were studio musicians who were consistent across the board uh, for the most part for people who were recording. They were recording with these with with these groups, um, no matter who they were. Um, so what was the influence or the power of those bands? Well, what I think, and this is only my opinion, is you had Stax doing their thing in Memphis, but then all of a sudden Willie Mitchell got a stroke of luck with his own sound, which Willie Mitchell was a band leader, which was a trumpet player who had recorded some good music on himself. So 
when he stumbled up on the Hodges brothers, Peeney, Leroy, and Charles Hodges, basically out of the church. And then they got this drummer, Howard Grind. They messed around and became so powerful to where across that water, whether it's Japan, whether it's England, whether it's Germany, everybody was trying to find that field because Seal Johnson was hidden, Otis Clay was hidden, O.V. Wright was the natural truth, and people was hidden. And I was this kid around all of this, all of this greatness. So like, okay. And then I would hang out as a child with the Hodges brothers. Because I came to high records at 15 going on 16. But watch this. When I left Mississippi, I didn't first come to Chicago. I was in Memphis. So now I'm going I'm to give you a little history here. So I was over there at Stax Records before I ever came to Chicago. And my mother just would sign the papers for me but I was recording for Isaac Hayes, who had his own studio. Even though he was signed to Stax, he had his own recording studio, which was called Universal Studios. And he had musicians, but he still was using the Barquets players and other cats around Memphis. Then you had Booker T and them. They eventually wound up recording a record, but they were just house musicians. Then you had people like Gene Boleg Miller, who was a trumpet player, who was a, a serious arranger. So I'm around all this greatness, a little child. I'm seeing all these grown folks do their thing. I'm seeing Sam and Dave. I'm seeing Carla Thomas. I'm seeing Rufus Thomas. Uh, 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 Luther Ingram, if loving you is wrong. I'm seeing all of this. I don't want to be right. So I had no other choice, but I'm like, whoa. And here it is. I'm this kid out of Mississippi, and I'm like, look at what I have gotten here, <laughs> right? So um, I would see Isaac Hayes if he was in town every day. You know, so it was, and back then, Gene, everybody was like, it was no competition situation. Everybody was just trying to keep a job and hope and pray to get a hit record. Because no one really knew what was going to happen. And then you had the staple singers, which were doing nothing but gospel, and realizing, okay, we can still do this over here too as long as we keep it clean and wholesome. And when they came out of college of Mississippi, once again, Gene, what's that? That's the Delta. You know, so um, everything just just mesh so well. And Muscle Show Group, which later I got a chance to record with those people. And I'm like, whoa. I, go, I, I don't believe that I'm actually with these guys, you know. And... Uh, and I would spend my own money to have them to do sessions for me. But we would do my sessions in Nashville. So it didn't make a difference where the music was recorded as long as you had those musicians. When I tell you there's no horn sound, no horn players have this, have this, have this unique. Uh, horn sound arrangement like those guys. And then you had the great uh, Harrison Calloway out of Alabama who was writing all the charts for Aretha, Elton John, Wilson Pickett. But once again, those house bands was the truth. You know, so they had that thing. Whether it was muscle show, stacks, or high rhythm section. Think about it. And how to just say high, 
it was called a high rhythm section. So it wasn't the horns, it was the rhythm section. So it was always something about each one of those. When you had stacks, they they main thing was what they could get from the barcades as a house band. And when you had muscle shows, it was what they could get out of the rhythm section and the horn sound. So ain't nothing like it. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. What was it that you think you learned the most being so young um, around that and absorbing it, especially because when you, it sounds like when you were there, that was at the height of all of those labels success um, and their and their peak of influence. What do you think are the like, let's say the top three things you learned from from being around those artists and that business at that time? I would have to say, um, being around Willie Mitchell, the producer, Willie Mitchell, to me, was like pretty much what Quincy Jones were to Michael Jackson. Because Willie Mitchell is the reason. He's... Um, He's responsible for my diction. He's responsible for how I phrase and how you will never, ever, ever have to try to figure out what is he saying in that song? What did he say? Because Willie Mitchell, he was a great teacher with that and he would pound you and pound you and pound you. He would say, boy, because you're from Mississippi, you don't have to sound like you're from Mississippi. Say the word like this. I mean, Al Green, if you hear Al Green talk, you'd be like, wow. Even to this day, you say, he's a country bumpkin. But when he's saying, how can you mean this broken heart and my knees? The, listen, listen to the distinctive diction how he phrased, how he pronounced those words. That's Willie Mitchell at its best. Willie Mitchell. So that would have to be my most influence in the music business ever. I learned how to write from watching Willie Mitchell. I learned how to produce from watching Willie Mitchell. You can't fool me on this stuff. And um, I um, I would like to say Willie Mitchell. I've met a lot of entertainers. You know, I met a lot of entertainers, uh, even 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 as a kid in Chicago, because, you know, um, I had great influence, you know, from the E. Rodney Jones, the Purvis fan who was managing me. You know, I was able to be able to be on stage with James Brown when James Brown was at his height. I was able to see the original Jackson Five. I was able to be with the original Temptations. I met them. I was able to be on the same bill with Aretha Franklin, uh, Barry White, um, Jackie Wilson. You know, the only one that I didn't get a chance to meet was Sam Cooke, but I was familiar with his music so well, you know. So, but um, you name it. I was blessed to to be on the stage either with them or standing backstage and watching how they worked and how they carried themselves. And today, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't know what happened. But it's a whole new day, Gene. It is. It is. And here's the and thing. I thank Thanks. God that I'm still a part of. Indeed. And things move forward and they change, but yet they're still the same. And what it takes to, to be successful is, is still just making sure that you're giving the people what they want, like as, as James might have said. Oh, um, yeah. What's oh, your, yeah. You named a lot of artists there. Who's your favorite artist or song uh, that's not your own, <laughs> that, that you didn't write or produce? Um, 
who's your favorite artist, especially to perform on the same show with or to watch or what favorite song like will always get you that is absolutely like the perfect song to you? Al Green. If I gave you my love, I tell you what I'll do. I'll expect a whole lot of love out of you. Got to be good to me. It was so good to me the way I recorded it, and it's still my favorite song to perform on my shows. And if I don't do that song, I don't care whether it's Chicago, whether it's New York, whether it's Detroit, whether it's Memphis, whether it's Milwaukee, it don't make a difference. If I don't sing that song, the women are truly mad. Disgusted. That's a must. That's a must. I got to do that song. And look, so, we generational with it too, because I grew up when my mama listening to that eight track, it would be click, oh, click, click, click. Listen, oh, yeah. I if I would come home on Sunday from church and mama was cooking and that was playing, I knew to go outside because it wasn't time for me. <laughs> that is it. And uh, I'm, I mean, you know, hey, it's, it's that song. Okay. All right. What do you think has led to your longevity in in music and what keeps you motivated to keep creating because you're still out there you just hit a big milestone on one of the streaming app uh platforms tell me about that but talk to me about lo like keeping longevity in the game because we see so many artists come and go artists that are good but for whatever reason they're not still in the game so talk to me about longevity and motivation well, I would have to say, for me, when it comes to longevity and motivation, one is I have to credit all that to the creator and giving God all honor for that is I'm able to still create and write songs that's relevant, not only to people of my age, but even to the younger generation. And the song that made the milestone is that song. Let me take you to my bedroom. Make your body go boom, boom, boom. So I listen to artists like uh, Neo. I listen to the Ushers. I listen to Alicia Keys. I listen to, and I definitely listen to Mary J because she stayed relevant even to today. So I listen to what the stations that play nothing but straight contemporary R&B so I can keep up with what's going on so I can stay relevant. And, and, uh, and I also surround myself with young musicians. Even for my stage, I roll with young musicians. You know, some of them I'm going to be their great granddaddy. You know what I mean? So, but um, I listen to the young guys of what they're doing. And, and believe it or not, I embrace it because when I was coming up, Gene, a lot of the older artists, they wouldn't share knowledge with me. They didn't even want to be bothered. I would have to steal what they was doing, sometimes hiding behind the stage. But they was not going to let you in on anything because their whole thing was, I got mine the hard way, you got to get yours the hard way. But that's fine and dandy. But with me, I share with the younger generation. Like there's a there's a young man by the name of Tucker. His real name is Tucker James. Not and only do I yes. So this young man, so I said, you know what? Wait a minute. If his number's doing this, and then blah blah blah, and he would come to my show when I wouldn't even know he was there, just to learn. But then when we became to where he could talk to me, it even got even closer. So his whole thing is not only do he trust me with his music, he have did some songs that I produced. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. And then you got, he got his own company. This young brother is really doing his thing. He got a new record right now that's really something else, which is called uh, uh, Take It Slow, which I think is going to be one of the greatest songs he's ever done. But they got the Calvin Richardson, who 
I had the pleasure, thank God, to produce a whole album on. And uh, and he got major airplay everywhere with a song that I was blessed to write, which was titled Treat a Right. So that's what I do. I, I keep my ears keen on what's relevant. What's You know what I'm saying? What are the young people doing? Now, I'm not trying to be the young guy because I couldn't be that if I wanted to. But I'm able to still relate to the younger generation. And they be like, Mr. Clay, you know, most of them call me Uncle Willie. I'm fine with that too. Because we as a people, we need to share knowledge. We as a people, we need to network more so that that rooted tree can continue to grow in us, with us, around us, and so it would still be a part of us as a people. So, with that being said, that's the only thing that I could account my longevity to. I mean, you know, you know, so um, I'm still able to get the phone ring, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, and, uh, and thank God the voice is still, you know, in pretty good shape, you know, so hey, it it's sounded all pretty good. good. It sounded awfully good. That's all I'm gonna say. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Last Thank question you. for you. Last question for you. And this is is from what we can do as people who are fans of the music. What what do you think? Because this is Black Music Month. Um, you know, a time to celebrate and honor the American Black contribution to the music canon. And uh, what do you think fans should do? to you know honor the month celebrate the month and the people who make the music what i think is that one is we as a people we need to support our musical heritage a little bit more we need to stop trying to critique and say well he don't sing as good as he no one has the same talent the thing is can you identify that you do have a talent? And some people never, ever identify. And those that really possibly could sing, stop telling them, oh, you need to just keep a day job. So that was told to me. That was told to me over 40 years ago. And I'm like, oh, I got the hell out of that relationship quick. Because as Marvin Gaye, God bless me. He gave me a gift to say, not to punch a clock. I'm going to punch my clock. I'm going to stay and give it all I got. But we still, as a people, stop critiquing. You might not like the way I sing, but somebody else might like it. So therefore, we can be a bad influence or we can be a good influence. And we both know social media is so powerful. Be careful with saying something negative about this artist or that artist because you don't know who and how many people you are reaching, how many shares you're doing, and that person shared that, and that person said, oh, he was nothing. You just killed my career. Support it. We as a people support one another please support black music keep us able to provide for not only our family but we can give the best that we have inside of us because you can say one thing and just tear a person completely down that support is, the music absolutely that is a beautiful sentiment, sir. Thank you so much for your honesty, for your time. Thank you. And from and for singing to me too. I sure do appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gene, for having me. You be oh, blessed. I sure will, my dear. Do we see each other? God bless you. <laughs>